session tonight, and uh, Brother Lester uh, brought it last night. He really uh, was prepared and, and uh, on point. I was thinking about uh, how many, how often it is that distractions come in uh, when you're doing this sort of thing. And of course, I'll tell you, uh, they they were there last night, but uh, God preserved Brother Lester's. Uh, focus and uh, stayed on task is a real blessing. Tonight we're going to have two more sessions. At 7 o'clock we'll have a break and then at 8 o'clock we'll have another session. And uh, I just wanted to remind y'all or let y'all know, those who are here, uh, we do have books back there, but Lester uh, is of course an author and, and he is now our uh, pastoral writer and uh, speaker for our church. Uh, but a selection of his books are back there to view, but those particular copies are not for sale, but we can get you a copy or uh, we can direct you uh, how you can find a copy to purchase. And so if you have questions about that, then, you know, speak up and we'll try to help you out. But let's open with a word of prayer and then we'll just invite Brother Lester to begin. Dear Grace of Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this night. Thankful for, again for this opportunity to uh, uh, to learn. And uh, God, I just pray you be with our speaker tonight, be with Brother Lester. Give him the words, give him focus, and give him energy, Lord, and, and Lord, allow us uh, as we uh, ingest what he's prepared for our understanding to deepen, for our faith in your word to grow, and uh, for our faith in you to grow. God, I pray you just bless our time together. And we thank you for your love in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. On this 29th day of April in 2022, I want to thank you for your presence and for your attention, and am ready to talk to you about your Bible and building a base, a foundation, so that you can understand better the strength, the authority, the accuracy of your Bible, that you don't have to go to church or anywhere else with your Bible wondering if it's really true. But you will have here and are receiving information that will help you make a personal decision, and I repeat that that's so important, that you learn for yourself why you have the Bible you have. Don't let me be the one that influences you. Don't have your Bible because some friend of yours thinks it's the best one. Know for yourself reasons why you chose this translation into English over a different translation in English. Last night we talked about the way God got his word to us. No one could have known. No one could have perceived anything really about God with any accuracy apart from his telling us, giving us what the Bible calls, and we believe, divine revelation. He instructed men, gave his word to pre-selected persons who received it from him, wrote it for us, and then we have it. At first it was in parts here and there, but eventually it was a completed work. It took about 16 centuries to get the job done. But then it was accumulated into a canon or into a book form, not just a piece here and a piece there, one individual's part of it, one book there, here, but a collection of books, and that's called a canon. And a canon being somewhat of a standard for us. And this is our standard. We Christians believe, real Bible Christians believe, that it is the final authority on everything, on our faith, our doctrinal positions, as well as what we practice in our lives and how we ought to live. That's not, we also talked about the difference between a source text and a target text. How that you're going from one text, which is your source, to a different text. That is the translation. That's primarily the way the word is used going from this, for example, Hebrew over to English or from Greek over to English. So we're going from a source text to a target text. I talked about how that is not the easiest thing to do. Tonight, in this third session, we're going to talk about two families of Greek text. Our center of thought last night was on the Old Testament, what the Jews still, many of them, call the Bible. They think of it the whole Bible. They do not accept or believe that the New Testament is on the same level with the Old Testament. Remember, Satan has been, for a long number of years, Satan has been attacking Bible, well, since Adam and Eve, you know, in the Garden of Eden, he asked the question, has God said, creating doubt in what God had said? He hasn't stopped that. It's an ongoing effort, and he's ever more subtle with it. And with the Old Testament, 
uh, as it was given to prophets. Remember the New Testament primarily apostles, but the Old Testament primarily prophets. As God gave that information to those men, uh, they wrote it down and kept it quite pure for a good period of time. But it wasn't long until there were questions about whether this is really the Word of God or not. So we talked about the Mesorets, the Mesoretic text, how that they were copiers in the 5th through about the uh, 10th centuries or four or 500 year period of time, and they came up with a standard Hebrew text in about the 7th century, long in there. I'm talking AD now. And they came up with that, and it became the standard basic center text for Bible-believing people. Uh, for Jews believed it, and Christians came along and believed it. They thought, we got that. We got it right. However, time went along, and there, there were some skeptics came on the scene, some critics came on the scene, and, and decided that those, that standard Masoretic text was really not that good. They claimed there were some older manuscripts which they found that were better than the ones the Masorets used. They started with poor source text, but these new guys thought they had a better source text, so they began to condemn the old uh, Masoretic text and came up with new text. And that caught on, and unfortunately it still lives today. Lots of seminaries and people who teach and, and I teach about the Bible, they think that the uh, Masoretic text is not the best, so they use some other information, some better text. But I mentioned also at the end of our session last night that when the Dead Sea Scrolls were uncovered, it just it seemed like the exact right moment in 1947, and they began to proliferate. I found uh, different, uh, in different caves over at Qumran in, in the Dead Sea side of Israel, they, they began to find these books, these old books. These old, they were individual, wrote, written on skins, and in these specially prepared uh, little canisters for them, about this tall and about this big around. They found every book of the Old Testament except the book of Esther, and those texts, which were written by the Essenes about the time of Christ, predating the uh, Meserets, and certainly predating uh, Rudolf Kettle and some of these guys who came along and said even the Mesorets were wrong. When they found these scrolls, which were just uh, not originals, but as close as you can get to an original, and they compared the Mesoretic text to those texts, those Qumran Dead Sea Scroll texts, they found it was a perfect match. Almost every case, a perfect match, which certainly I think gives great credibility to the Masoretic text, which King James translators used and others have used as not being a poor source text, but a very valid source text, much better than Rudolf Kettle and some of those guys contend their stuff is. Tonight, we're going to focus on the New Testament, the New Testament text. You understand again that the Bible was not written in English. It was written, the Old Testament, primarily Hebrew, some Aramaic. The New Testament was almost exclusively written in Greek, a little bit of Aramaic in Matthew, but not a whole lot. So we're talking here about the New Testament tonight. I'm going to focus on that. You already have seen how Satan has attacked the standard text of the Old Testament. He has done just as much work, if not more, in attacking the text of the New Testament, the standard text of the New Testament. There was not a standard for a long time, so we're going to talk about how it got here. So in your workbook, if you don't have one, just raise your hand. Somebody may maybe bring you one, or you can walk to the back and get one. We have these workbooks here with some, some blanks, and I'll try and make sure to mention the blanks tonight so you can get all of those. So we're talking about New Testament source text. Remember, source text is the one from which you're going to translate into another language, which is the target text over here. So now we're looking at Greek, primarily Greek being the sourced uh, language of the New Testament books, the 27 books of the New Testament. There are two basic families, that's the word, families of New Testament source documents, source text, two families. Remember, there were copies being made of what were initially the original ones written by Paul and 
and uh, these other authors, Matthew, Mark, Luke, these guys, they were used of God. They are the apostles who were the inspired ones. He gave this truth to them, and they then, in fact, wrote it down in these books. And we have these books. You know, we have them all right here. <laughs> it's called the New Testament of our Bible, so you can just open it up. There they are. This is who God used to give us the information there. And it is divinely inspired. One of them, the Apostle Paul said, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. All Scripture. And he's talking not only about what the New Testament has to say, talking, I think, about what the Old Testament has to say. So in the New Testament, we're looking here at two basic families. As documents are being written, they're not always agreeing because, because of copying of documents. There are mistakes that are made. We talked a little about that last night. It's hard to take one page, like this page, in your workbook and take a clean sheet of paper and write it down over here exactly. It's so easy to leave out a comma or misspell a word or leave off of it. It's just hard to do. And so as these New Testament books were being copied, there were lots of different copies, but there were some variances in these copies. I want to give you a basic understanding, and we'll come to this, and I'll make the point. Basic understanding of available source text and evidence and tell you that it is important to any person seeking to confirm the reliability of your Bible. If you don't understand something about what I'm discussing tonight and did last night, it will be impossible for you out here to decide whether your translation is really good. Because remember what I said at the end of last night's session. No target text will ever be stronger than the source text. If there are corruptions that back here in the source and they're carried over, regardless of the goodness or how accurately the translation is done or translating is done, you're going to carry over the errors from here to there and just replicate them from generation to generation. So it's so important to understand the source text and that they were right and which source text are right. Because unfortunately, we saw last night there are two major areas of Hebrew source text for the Old Testament. Likewise, there are two major areas of source text for the New Testament books. And so we'll talk here. There are currently well over 5,200 extant, that would be the right word, uh, existing, or E-X-T-A-N-T, existing ancient Greek manuscripts of a part or the whole of the New Testament. That's quite a number. That's a whole lot more copies than we have of any of the Greek philosopher writings or a whole lot of other manuscripts that are in a secular type in nature. So here we're looking at 5,200 existing copies. And I might say that the number continues to rise as new discoveries are made. Now, when, when archaeologists are digging around and Go into an old tell, an old mound, which was once a city, and many of them had libraries, like the one in Mosul, Iraq. It's ancient Nineveh. When they were digging in that area, they found a big library. It wasn't a library of books like this. It was a library, in that case, of clay, you know, where, where they had wrote things in clay and had a seal on it by a certain king, one of those Assyrian kings. There are a lot of these being found, still being found. So this number of existing ancient Greek manuscripts continues to grow. I will tell you there are not as many whole copies of the New Testament as there are of the old, or, or, or as, as there are parts of copies. There are a good many. Even so, those, many of those, most of those that are found are not 27 books in all one place. They'll find a copy of Matthew, or a copy of Romans, or a copy of Jude, or the Revelation. So many fragments, more pieces, maybe a page or three or four pages than a whole copy. But all total, 5,200 of these existing copies. Furthermore, there are over 8,000 manuscripts of very early translations into languages such as Latin and Syriac, and other languages. The translating business picked up pretty quickly 
after the books were finished, the last one being the Apocalypse of the Revelation in about 95, it's generally commonly understood about 95 AD. So people started translating right away into other languages because remember, this was in Greek, and Greek was the language of the Roman Empire. But two, their classical Greek, it's a high person's type Greek, and then there was the lower Greek, the Koine Greek, it's a common man's Greek, called vulgar language sometimes. Don't misunderstand vulgar, it's not the same sense we use somebody doing something vulgar. It simply means common. It was the common language, the vulgar language of the letter. It's called Latin Vulgate, not some slander. It's just talking about the common man. And I'm personally convinced that one of the ways God had of getting his word out to everybody, especially in the Greek empire, I mean the, the Roman empire, was to put it in a common language so that everybody could understand it. It's kind of like Pigeon English in Papua New Guinea, which I mentioned last night. There are 600 different languages over there, but nearly everybody understands one language, Pigeon English. In Rome, there were lots of different languages. All these people they conquered had their own languages, but they all got a hold of Koine Greek. And so nearly everybody, and the first books of the Bible were written in the common man's language, in the Koine Greek. So the ordinary person, if he could get a copy of it or see it somewhere, and he knew how to read or write or she, they could read that and see that. In addition to these, there are hundreds of writings by early Christian leaders. Sometimes these are referred to as the, uh, as the uh, uh, four fathers, uh, you know, Christian fathers, early fathers. They wrote, a lot of these guys, in fact, I have a set, I think it's in the church, uh, Brother Darren's library over here. I think there are 17 volumes, I believe it's 17 volumes, and they're about this thick. I mean, they're huge volumes of these writings, these these uh, ancient Nicenes and Nicenes and all of that, there's some wording to give reason why that's called that. But I'm just telling you, these were right people, were literate people who could read and write, and there are many of them pastors of, uh, or had by this time, some of the uh, Roman Catholic Church had begun to develop. It wasn't fully formed, but they were they were pastors and became sort of uh, bishops and and uh, high men, and they were talking about the Bible. Many of their writings listed books in the Bible. They quoted from these books that were books of the Bible. So when you put all of those together, there are more than 86,000 quotes or allusions to scriptures that have been counted to date. That's a lot, a lot of proof, a lot of evidence to substantiate our case for the New Testament. We're just talking New Testament here. Modern scholars have categorized these ancient dust documents into two types. That may not be the best way to put it, according to most scholars or many scholars, but that's what they did. They call these, put these into two types. And <clears throat> there, are, there are actually uh, four, technically. I want to give them to you. There's one called the Byzantine uh, text. That's the type text, the Byzantine. I'll explain that a little more in just a moment. Then there's also a group of these called the Western text. Thirdly, there is the Caesarean text. And finally, the Alexandrian text. Now, the Alexandrian is the one you want to kind of get hold of there because it became the known text as opposed to the Byzantine text. The other major family I set up here, we'll look at two basic families. One of them is the Byzantine family of texts. One of them is the Alexandrian family of texts because all those others are sort of amalgamated under the umbrella of the Alexandrian text, and generally that's the name we give to that. Though there are slight differences, the Western, Caesarean, and Alexandrian texts all fall under one umbrella and constitute one text type. Uh, as I mentioned, there is some debate about whether that's a good way to categorize these or not, and whether it's even valid. But you have to have some distinction to separate those who are what I would call, for lack of a better terminology here, orthodox, and those who are very liberal. And that's basically what the breakdown is. So let's talk about the first of these, the Byzantine text. The Byzantine text. 
I'm not trying to explain too much about Byzantium and why these are called Byzantine right now, but it'll come out as we're moving forward. So if you're questioning, just hold your question for a little while. The family of documents generally known as Byzantine texts are also generally known as majority text. The majority text. Sometimes they're called the received text, and sometimes the traditional text. I have a number of King James Bibles, and not everyone includes it, depending on whether it's an Oxford or a Cambridge or maybe a Thomas Nelson or whoever published your particular edition of the King James Bible. But I have a couple where if you're reading in the beginning, it will tell you this is indeed the authorized text, or this is the text that is the received text. Now, received and authorized are not referring to the same ex thing exactly. Um, the authorized text is because the King James was authorized by King James, who was the king of England at the time. So it, he authorized this. You know, it wasn't altogether legal to print Bibles at some of our history, and especially in England. So here's one that was legal because the king authorized the text. But in the, pre pre uh, the beginning or in the uh, first part of many Bibles, you will also have the statement that the text is a traditional or received text. That's telling you that it comes primarily from the majority manuscripts, the Byzantine text. So know that. Let's talk about the majority manuscripts. That's the blank there. The majority manuscripts can be misleading, uh, mis uh, misleading terminology. Let me explain that. It's not wrong technology, but you need some understanding to grasp it. Often this terminology is used in reference to the family of documents known as the Byzantine or the majority text. You see that in your notes. I'm going slowly here and deliberately because it's so important you absorb what I'm saying tonight here. So this is because the number of manuscripts in this family is far greater than all other ancient biblical New Testament manuscripts combined. Much greater. Far more Byzantine or majority text than all of the others in, under that bigger umbrella of the um, Alexandrian text. Just a few of those, but a whole lot of these Byzantine texts. So it's called majority because it's majority in number. There's a reason for that, we'll see. The Byzantine text, the received text, traditional text, is not one single document. I want you to think as we're going through this, that well, you're talking about one copy of Greek here. No, <laughs> there were hundreds of copies. But they all, when you looked at them, fell into, under the umbrella of one of these families or the other. So it's not one single document, but rather a family or a stream of manuscripts which began with the apostolic, or, uh, apostolic churches, that is not uh, Pentecostal, but apostolic in that they were of the apostles, those churches, and continued to appear at intervals down through the Christian era, uh, especially at the beginning. They continued to appear. Lots of them came on the scene. It was protected in different places by the wisdom and the scholarship of those who believed and practiced first century Christianity. I often talk about first century Christianity. If you just use the word Christian today, it is so broad and such a big umbrella. You know, the Jehovah's Witnesses call themselves Christians. The Catholics call themselves Christians. The Baptists call themselves Christians. Uh, the, the Mormons call themselves Christians. We're talking about first century Christianity being the kind that was taught and practiced in the Bible which was given in the New Testament of the Bible, which was given in the first century. That's what it's called first century. It was in that century that Jesus Christ was here in body. It was during his lifetime that he established a church. That's the reason it's called a New Testament church. There was not a church in the sense of a called out assembly of baptized believer in the Old Testament. 
It's a New Testament thing. Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against So he, in his lifetime, which was in the first century, established his church, and these books about his life, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these biographies of him, as well as then all the explanatory books, uh, starting with the book of, of uh, Acts as a history, and then Romans being the explanatory books, they, are all, they were all written in the first century. And so this is a kind of, of Christianity that is the right kind. Jesus established it, taught it, and they practiced that pretty closely, not all together, but pretty closely throughout the first century. So I often refer to first century Christianity. And some people look at me like a calf looking at a new gate. I don't know what you're talking about. It's a blank deer in the headlights look. The reality is the only real Christianity there is is first century Christianity. Everything else is spurious. The further you get from first century Christianity, the further you are from truth. So there's where we're going and are as we talk about this matter. <clears throat> the Christians in Palestine uh, were the first century Christians, uh, and, and they were, most of Israel, you know, was wiped out. At least their independence was taken away in 70 AD when Rome uh, attacked. They were too rebellious for too long, so the Romans sent century, uh, soldiers down there, and they destroyed Rome or destroyed Jerusalem, Israel, in 70 AD. A few uh, rebels held out on Masada for a few more years, but then they were eventually overcome as well. So we're talking here about the type of Christianity practiced in the first century. And it was um, these leaders of these first century churches <laughs> And those believers, because it was not just a preacher and then the membership arrangement then, there, there was certainly, there were pastors of those churches. But let me tell you, back in those first century churches, everybody was pretty involved. For one thing, if you're going to be a Christian, it's going to cost you something. You may lose your life. You remember that Peter and John and the other apostles were brought up before the, the Sanhedrin court, the ruler of the Jews, and they were beaten. So it was not an easy thing to be a Christian, but Christians, members as well as the leaders, stood up for the cause and were not ashamed to be, and they were known, or, or they not only were known as Christians, but they became knowing Christians. They knew what Christianity was. They had embraced something that they understood, and they therefore believed in these great teachings that we read in the New Testament, these teachings of Christ that were elaborated on and propagated by these apostles. Also, I need to point out to you that not only did were these early documents taken care of and protected, a lot of them weren't written yet, but they mean how this first century tribe of Christianity was was protected by the church at Antioch. Remember, Jerusalem, Mother Church, had a baby church, not another campus, but a baby church out here in the Antioch of Syria, Syria, and then that church had churches. Also, the Eastern Orthodox, uh, which came on the scene later, really about 300 years later, had a church at Constantinople. There was a split between the Western Catholics and the Eastern Catholics. And they weren't even fully formed by then, but they were getting along far enough that they had strong leaders and couldn't get along with each other. So eventually they split into two groups, those who were at Rome, the Roman Catholic Church, those who were at Constantinople, over to the eastern, uh, east of ways, they, they were the Eastern Orthodox Catholic Church, believed basically the same things, had some difference, but nevertheless, they stood up, especially the ones in the East, stood up for the Byzantine text. After all, their place became known as Byzantium, that was their city. What is now, or, or but later became Constantinople, and it became Constantinople because when the pressure from the Germans, the nomadic tribes that were coming through, when the pressure got great enough on Rome, the city, the central government area and the city of the Roman Empire, some of the guys, Constantine being the first, realized we can't sustain our position here, so we have to flee 
because they're strong enough to overrun us. So he moved the capital to the to to uh, Byzantium to what is what he, he renamed the place and called it Constantinople. We call it Istanbul today. So that's where it is on that end. So all this is a bunch of history, I realize, but you need to understand specifically those to the east stayed closer to the scriptures and had more copies of the scriptures than the ones in the west, the ones at Rome. They are the first ones that really begin to go away. One thing, they wouldn't let ordinary people see the Bible or any books of the Bible, and so they had to, the people had to believe what they were told was the truth, and what they were being told wasn't the truth. It was, it was being uh, hidden. Many things were being hidden from them. So they, on the eastern end, were protecting New Testament Christianity. There were also other believers who were not in either of those camps. And you look, you know, the leg kicking the football in the Mediterranean Sea, it's called Italy, and Rome's down here about the middle, up here at the top, you have Milan, and then mountains happen. So northern Italy is very mountainous area. When the believers, or at least the church, as it would call itself, in Rome begin to strengthen, they begin to put pressure on everybody that didn't join up with them persecute them. They didn't just laugh at them and sneer them and call them ugly names. They cut their tongues out. They wrapped them to a pole with ropes and burned them at the stake. Burned them to like, burn them to a crisp. I mean, they killed them in a lot of hard, harsh ways. Many of those believers didn't go with that big machine that was developing, came the Roman Catholic Church. They fled. Where'd they go? To the mountains. Many of them went over the mountains, and they're in, in France, in southern France. And if you know about those mountains in that area, they're precipitous mountains. They're bigger than the Rocky Mountains. They have lots of caves and lots of places. And this is where God seemed to protect a lot of our forefathers, who later became called the men of the valleys, the Waldensians, the Waldensians is what they were called in those languages. So this is what's going on. And these people in these places where they can escape the long hand of the persecutors of those who would not become Roman Catholics and join in the state church, they were keeping the Byzantine text and writing copies of them. Also, over in, in the British Isles area, Wells was a stronghold that never became Catholic. They later did. I mean, never, at least in those days, became Catholic. And they were also keeping scriptures especially in Wells and some other spots as well, but over there. Most manuscripts in this family are dated around 400, and some of them earlier, but a lot of them later. They really started in about 300, and there's a reason for that. There's evidence that this copy is a, uh, these type copies, though, existed well before this period, period of time. Now, copies of the Scripture in this family are in very close agreement. That's the word. There's no doctrinal disagreement. There are some clerical errors because of the copying issues and words, you know, like I said, are not spelled exactly the same or maybe punctuation not the same and most of the things. Sometimes order is, is reversed. There are places where you read in your Bible about Jesus Christ. Sometimes the copiers would put Christ Jesus. They just, it didn't really change too much meaning, but they, they made mistakes. They were humans. They were making copies. So um, copies of the scriptures in this family, though, are in close agreement with no doctrinal disagreement of any substance. It cannot be denied that they form one family of message. This is the Byzantine or the majority text. Over the years, the central message of these manuscripts became known as the received text, the one that King James put in his book when he first got it going, and that is sometimes you can find it in the beginning of the, the first pages of, of a Bible you may get, the received text. So these are what they were called. Manuscripts embodying the common truths of this family of text were translated into Latin. <coughs> Scriptures of this sort were also uh, translated into a lot of other languages, uh, but especially Latin. Jerome was a guy who lived he was literate. He lived in Bethlehem. 
He spent a long time, lots of years, translating the Bible from the Greek into Latin, the common language, vulgar, vulgate. That's why it's called Jerome's Latin Vulgate. So he got that uh, going in his time. And uh, this is what was going on with scriptures in many cases throughout the Dark Ages, from about 500 to about 1400, 1500, right along in there. A lot of, a lot of uh, translating, a lot of new copies being made, and that sort of thing was going on. Even the enemies of the majority text or the received text admit that 19 twentieths of all Greek manuscripts are of the majority text. That's most of them. That's 95%. More than 90, 96% are just, I think, of all the texts there are, are of, of the majority text. The received text made its way into Latin, as I said, and a whole lot of other languages, but all are in basic agreement and support this family of documents. So I'm reading here, so you make sure you get this. Note that not all of the ancient manuscripts state passages in exactly the same way, but they do not contradict, they do not undermine each other. They're in basic harmony. No critic, and I want to quote this especially, has yet explained how a long, slow process spread out over many centuries, and we're talking probably 10 centuries, a thousand or more years here, who knew nothing of the state of the text outside their own monastery there's in Scriptoria. Scriptoria is where they copied just scriptures. I want to pause here. I got to elaborate you. You need to understand this. They didn't have cell phones. They didn't have landlines. They didn't have electricity going on back in those days. They lived in some remote country, far from each other. Most people who lived in a town or a village in Paris and London and those places had developed just yet. They lived in a little area, and most of the people never made it more than 10 miles from the place they were born in that time. So I'm talking about people who were copying Scripture. They didn't know what was going on in the next county, certainly not the next nation, anywhere. But this is going on all over here. And yet, in spite of the fact that they're not connecting with each other and collaborating with each other, they still came out with texts that are in total agreement, almost total agreement. No doctrinal disagreement at all. So I will continue that. Who knew nothing of the state of the text outside of their own monasteries of Scriptoria could achieve this widespread uniformity out of the diversity presented by the earlier form of the text. How they could do that had to be a thing of God. I think God not only gave his word, but I believe God has preserved his word. And I believe this is part of the way that God did it. As this guy says, any explanation other than divine guidance imposes impossible strengths on our imagination. <laughs> I like the way that's worded. Let me talk to you about the authority of this family of documents and how it is attested. It is attested by the overwhelming number of existing documents, all of which closely support essentially the same wording same claims, and the same theology. Remember, over 5,200 ancient Greek New Testament manuscripts exist in part or in whole today, and that number is growing. In addition to Greek manuscripts, there are manuscripts in Syriac and Latin and Gallic, which would be over in the British Isles area, and many other languages which bring the total to well over 24,000. I thought it might be a good idea to bring one of them here, so I have a little show and tell. This is an Assyrian Bible. It's called the Peshetta. You have studied a little history. This is a copy of the Peshetta. It's in, it's in Syrian. It's in Aram, Aramaic. Jesus spoke Aramaic, by the way, and this is written in Aramaic. And like Hebrew, it reads from the back to the front and left to right, or right, right to left. Uh, this, is, this is a copy. I think it's important for you to realize this copy was translated in approximately 160 to 170 A.D. The last book of the New Testament, the Revelation, came along in 95. I'm, I'm bringing this to illustrate that copying and translating 
started right away. And they had, they had the early stuff. They had, maybe some of them even at that point had the originals. Don't know, we don't know for sure where all the originals went. But they were so close that, that eras had not really crept in just yet into this picture. So we're looking at the Assyri Assyrian Peshetta, uh, and I will say this, at the first, when this was translated, they left out the book of 2 Peter, 2 John, Jude, and the Revelation. Just to give you a little heads up, not to focus of our study here, early on, those four books, and maybe one other, were somewhat questioned. There were people who said, we don't think these belong, as there was debate going on in, in the Christian community about which books belonged and which books out of the 27 we have. So when this book was translated into Assyrian, or this Peshetta here, it was it left out four books. However, a little later, in 616, after some more research, they added it back, added those books back. So they got them all in there. And it's, I just think you need to realize tangibly, it's not just talking about remote things that maybe, you can see it was happening. And here we have even a modern copy of this ancient document showing that it really happened. I want to talk about the authenticity of this family of documents and how it is attested. Authenticity is the word there. By the overwhelming number, again the word, of existing or extant documents, all of which closely support essentially the same wording, claims, and theology, over 5,200 ancient Greek New Testaments exist in part and whole. These I've just been talking about. There are, listen to this, only about 45, 50 documents in the other Alexandrian family. <laughs> I mean, here's 40 or 50 documents, mainly two. But 45 or 50 at the max, which many modern translators call these the better manuscripts. I've never been able to quite grasp why these, and you're going to see other reasons why they're not really good manuscripts. But these modern translators, many of whom are bent on liberalism and don't really believe the Bible is inspired, they have sought every mean they can to deceive innocent people like you and me into believing that they had a cache of old documents, much older than the Byzantine text, that were a whole lot better than the Byzantine text. And there were a bunch of them. And they don't like for us to call the Byzantine text the majority text because there's so many of them. They're not just a little majority. Like I said, they're 98% of all there exists. But you hear very little of that. People go down here to the Christian bookstore. You go online to buy a Bible. You think they're going to tell you any of that stuff? They just got a Bible for sale, and you don't know what it is. You don't know where it came from, what it was translated from. It's just now in English, and you don't know if it came from a Byzantine background or it came from an Alexandrian background. So, talking about these. When Constantine came to power and made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire, it appears to me that the recognized scripture of his time was relatively unpolluted. There's a lot of these errors hadn't got in just yet. He demanded copies of the scriptures to be made and took some of them with him to Constantinople, which was, became the head of the Byzantine Empire, named that city uh, uh, Byzantium. So when he moved the capital from Rome under the pressure of uh, nomadic tribes uh, going to attack Rome, and it did fall, by the way, and they regained themselves, but they fell. So he had already taken the capital over to the east and set up this uh, special city, this city that we call Constantinople. He called Constantinople. Uh, it, it was his desire, since he's the guy who said, we're going to make Christianity the state religion of the Roman Empire. If we're going to do that, and I think the reason he did it, in my own opinion, uh, I have serious doubts of whether he knew the Lord, but he was in power. So he converted to Christianity because he had already seen that you can't snap out these Christians. They had already killed them and killed them in that Colosseum in Rome. That didn't stop them. In fact, one guy said the blood of the martyrs is a seed of new converts or something to that effect. So 
Christians were multiplying. Costine realized if you can't whip them, just join them. <laughs> so he was a smart enough guy to realize, let's join the state, the power of the government, to the power of this church that I can't get rid of, and let's make it a state church. Let me tell you, the Americans were very staunch against the state church, and you ought to be. But I'm not going to go on that rabbit trail. I'll just tell you, brothers and sisters, that when he made, when he wed the church in the state, he said, we need to convince the masses to join this thing, to be a part of this church. And he didn't view churches like Northwest Baptist and First Baptist. And he viewed a church. As far as he's concerned, it was a universal, visible church. And he wanted all the people in Rome to be a part of it. He didn't want any competition. So that's why he began to make war on everybody who would not join the state church. And believe me, he made war. Not just him, but his followers over the next thousand or nine hundred years, called that Dark Ages, murdered 50 million who didn't join them. They were serious about, you got to be a member of this, or you're a heretic and heresy is punishable by death. So we're going to kill you. I'm going to do it if you baptize your babies. We'll take care. Or you, you, you got to sprinkle them here in this church. You, you, you can't do that other stuff you Christians have been doing. No, sir, I'm in charge. I'm Pontifus Mat uh, What do you say, the Pontifus Matimus? Maximus? Yeah, I think I got it. I'm the guy. I'm the head of this operation here. You're going to join us or you're going to die. That's the way it came. And a lot of persecution went on. So he wanted scriptures to be written, so he commissioned people all over the empire to write the scriptures down. If you have a copy, make a copy. This is the time that these documents really begin to proliferate. Lots of them. Let's talk now about this other family of text, this Alexandrian family, the other side. I mentioned there weren't very many texts to support this position, but it's the liberal. It's the position that doesn't really believe that the Bible is inspired, that the scriptures were inspired. They're just books like uh, Homer's Iliad or, or Aristotle's writings. This is it's a small family of manuscripts, and it is, it's a very small family and stream. It consists of these. Now, I want to list them for you here. Not all of them, but the main ones. The first two I mean, the real backbone and strength, skeleton of the Alexandrian family of text are these two. First, the Vatican MS. It's sometimes categorized by scholars as, as Codex B. Also, the Sinaitic, uh, Sinaitic, Sinaitic, Attic, Sinaitic, I can't say that word tonight. And it's, uh, it's known as Codex, Codex Aleph. Codex Alexandrius, Alexandrinus, which is supposedly a hybrid of Byzantine text and gospel writings, are also a part of the Alexandrian text in some other places. But the first main two are the ones I just mentioned, the one from the Vatican and one from Mount Sinai. And then there's also a small number of approximately 45, maybe 50, if you get liberal, ancient documents which are somewhat infected with Gnosticism and Greek philosophy. And you probably don't know much about Gnosticism or Greek philosophy, but come back for the next session here and just after the break, we want to talk about those. <laughs> It'll floor you if you don't know already about stuff about it. Then there's also the Latin Vulgate. Remember, that's the one that Jerome, I mentioned a while ago, wrote down in Bethlehem, or a translation he made. <clears throat> and it's the main source text for the Catholic Douay translation of the Bible. And Catholics today have other translations, but their mainstay Bible for a long, long time, which for many years only priests could read, it's the Douay translation of the Bible. So that Douay translation came from the Alexandrian family of texts. Those omissions were prompted by heretical beliefs such as Arianism, Arianism, there was a man named Arian back in those days. He didn't think Jesus Christ was the Son of God. He's one of the very first Jehovah's Witnesses. He believed basically what the Jehovah's Witnesses do today and didn't think Jesus was God, really God, just an offspring, just a sort of 
secondary, being it was not really God with all the powers of God. Lots of people followed him. Denying the deity of Christ, he found a large following, especially up through Germany and, and uh, some of those states up above Germany. The Unical type, the Unical, if you've probably seen, it's all capitals. It's a different sort of looking language, but it's all in e English. I mean, it's about, a, about a say in English, it, it, it's all capitals. In, in English, they do it in capitals as well. But the Unical, Unical type of the Alexandrian manuscripts originated in the fourth century under heretical conditions and poor scholarship. So this is a part of that Alexandrian family of texts, and the much uh, much of Christian used the Byzantine text from the 4th through the 19th centuries, I think, is proof of God's provincial, providential blessing and protection of it. It prevailed. The Byzantine text, the majority text, ruled the roost for that many years. Gosh, that's a long period of time. But yet, Satan is insistent. He never quits. And so Satan is always trying to worm his way in and undermine. And even when you have a solid Greek set of text and people are on the same page or teaching basically the same truths, Satan's never satisfied. He's coming one way or another to undermine. And that's what we're going to see in the next session. So I'm giving you a little extra time today, at least this session, because I'm going to need it next session. There's a real a madness to, uh, um, to this thing here. So I'm going to go, uh, wait, let's, let's just have the break right now and come back in 15 minutes. So let's just estimate and say that 10 after, try to be back in here, 10 minutes after uh, 8 o'clock, and we'll start. And that will give me a little extra time to try to say something about the Gnostics and about the uh, Greek philosophers and a bunch of that stuff. So thank you. You're dismissed for now.